I'm Mark Golub, and in the news, we continue to deal with the fallout from the Obama abstention in the United Nations Security Council on a resolution really slamming Israel for its settlement policy, and then the follow-up address by Secretary of State John Kerry, who sought to justify the abstention. And on our JBS phones right now, I am so pleased to welcome back to JBS a major voice on the American Jewish scene. He's become something of a controversial figure of his own. Mort Klein, president of the ZOA, the Zionist Organization of America. Mort, thank you so much for joining us. Well, it's great to be here. I must say I'm uh, no longer so controversial. Now people understand that a Palestinian state would be a terror state. They understand the that the Jewish communities are not the reason there's no, and Judea, Judea and Samaria are not the reason there's no peace. Uh, now they, people realize that, as we, as the always said all along, uh, Oslo and the Gaza withdrawal, because of Arafat and Abbas and the whole regime there, uh, they have no interest in peace. Uh, so really, uh, our positions are hardly uh, uh, controversial. Uh, in fact, the polls show half or more of the American Jews and the Israeli Jews uh, agree with the ZOA position. Okay, well, if we have time... I'll talk about your controversiality. But first, All right. <laughs> I, I want to know more. You've been, ZOA has been very on top of this story. Uh, you send out a lot of articles, releases. When you first heard that the United States had abstained on the UN Security Council resolution, what were your thoughts? Well, frankly, in September and October, we, we painfully predicted this. I, we, we took out full-page ads in the New York Times and Jewish papers around the country. We had press conferences with John Bolton and others. We wrote articles saying uh, that, the, that the evidence is overwhelming that he's going to do this uh, for various reasons. And I asked uh, the leaders of major Jewish organizations to join me in a campaign to make this a public issue to, to sort of smoke out uh, President Obama to force him to say he's not going to do it. But all the Jewish leaders I spoke to, the ones you know, told me I'm being ridiculous. He'll never do this. I talked to Senator Schumer, in fact, in front of a group of us, and he said, don't be silly. He will never do this uh, because Congress will go crazy. And so uh, nobody spoke out about this except ZOA. I think we could have uh, potentially stopped this. So we were not surprised. We expected this. That's why we spent all the money on the ads. Okay. By the way, I was also surprised I would have argued with the Schumer types who said, are you crazy? Obama's, Obama's not that crazy. And so see, I, in I, the WikiLeaks, top Obama officials said there's going to be consequences if Israel uh, does not establish a state. Uh, uh, and and uh, Obama began to use the word strongly condemn about Israeli building. <laughs> and, uh, and publicly, his spokesman said, we're going to carefully consider our future engagement on UN matters. So there are all sorts of strong hints that something was going to happen. And finally, with the New York Times having an editorial in early December urging such resolutions in the U.N., and Jimmy Carter having an op-ed urging such resolutions, we believe this was an orchestrated campaign uh, uh, of Obama to get people used to this idea. And uh, so that's why we, we thought this was definitely going to happen. That's why we made an issue out of it. It's you know, we spoke with Brett Stevens, and he wrote a piece where he said he thinks, indeed, the United States was behind this resolution even though they did not submit it to the Security Council. And even after it seems like Donald Trump was part of a group that convinced Egypt not to go forward with the resolution, the, the countries that did were in fact working in league with the United States. I don't Absolutely. want your, oh, wait a minute, I don't want your opinion, Mort. I only want to know if you have any evidence or whether you know for a fact that the United States did in, was, in fact, the driving force of this resolution? Look, the only evidence we have is uh, major articles in the Egyptian media uh, stating uh, that Saab Arakat, uh, the leadership of the Palestinian Authority in Washington, met with Kerry, met with Susan Rice, met with other uh, officials planning this. This is in the Egyptian media. And, uh, and also the fact that uh, statements there that uh, Joe Biden called various members of, of the Security Council Look, if the Security Council knew that America is going to veto this, they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't bring it forward. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't waste their time and, and be humiliated. Mm -hmm. They brought this forward because they knew that America was not going to uh, 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 
do, uh, do this. And uh, so I believe that uh, Obama was uh, involved in this. In fact, I can tell you, when I asked John, uh, Se- Secretary Kerry several months ago and, S- and Samantha Power, the ambassador to the U.N. from the United States, I asked them each in- individually, independently, will you veto an anti-Israel resolution before January 20th if it comes to pass? Each of them said, we don't know of any such thing happening. And I said, but if it does happen, we veto it. And they said, we're not going to comment unless we see it. Mm-hmm. That was another sign that they were planning Very something. interesting. Now, the audience should know, I don't get to talk to John Kerry. I don't get to talk to Samantha Powers. But no one be, should be surprised. I talk to many people on the American Jewish scene and leadership, and I speak to you, Mort, not only on camera but off camera. And I spoke to you after this passed, and I said to you then, why do you think President Obama did it? And I'm going to ask you again on camera. Why do you think President Obama permitted this U.N. resolution slamming Israel, slamming the settlements, making Israel the heavy? Why did Obama do it? I'll answer that. Your audience should know this resolution says everything past the 67 line is occupied Arab land. That means the Western Wall, the Temple Mount, the Jewish Quarter, Hadassah Hospital, Hebrew University, they're all now, according to the United Nations resolution, on occupied Arab land. And it says that the, that the world, the states in the world should distinguish between the territories of Judea and Samaria and eastern Jerusalem and Israel itself. In other words, this gave a huge boost to BDS to boycott, uh, divest, and sanction Israel. Uh, and the reason he did it is because President Obama has enormous hostility to Jews and Israel. For 22 years, he was a member of an anti-Semitic, anti-Israel church headed by Jeremiah Wright, a man I went to high school with, by the way, <laughs> uh, which promoted vicious hatred of, uh, against Jews in Israel. Uh, and he called Pastor Wright a great man and my mentor. Would he go to a, such a horrible church for 22 years if he was uncomfortable with those sermons. No, he was comfortable with them. And his closest friends include Louis Farrakhan. Yes, he was a member of the Million Man March for Louis Farrakhan. Rashid Khalidi, an anti-Israel, anti-Semitic professor at University of Chicago at that time, now at Columbia. Uh, Ali Abu Nema, a vicious uh, hater of Israel against Israel's existence. Bill Ayers, another anti-Israel guy. His closest friends were anti-Israel. So he did this because of this enormous hostility to Israel. If Shimon Peres was the prime minister, he would have done the same thing. This had nothing to do, uh, little to do, with Netanyahu being prime minister. It had everything to do <laughs> with his feelings toward Israel. Because remember, he made a speech in Cairo in 2009 <laughs> where he compared the way the Israelis treat the Palestinians <laughs> the same as the Nazis treated the Jews. So this was before he got, had a relationship with Netanyahu. And during the campaign, when he was running in 08, he said that we must respect that Hamas and Hezbollah have legitimate claims. The two terrorist groups have legitimate claims. That was in the May 8th issue, two, May 16th issue, 2008 of the New York Times. I'm saying that because people can, will not believe that, that what I just said is true. So he, this is a man who had enormous hostility to Israel and to Jews. And uh, <laughs> Mark Levin, Caroline Glick, uh, many others have publicly called him an anti-Semite. <laughs> and the Simon Wiesenthal Center this week said the most anti-Semitic act of the year was this resolution. So if he allowed an anti-Semitic resolution to pass, and this was an anti-Semitic resolution, this is a man who has hostility to Jews and to uh, the Jewish state. Okay. By the way, I hear what you said, and you were very careful in your words. The word you used was hostility towards Israel. Can I, look, you're on JBS, you're being seen across the nation. Mort Klein, if someone says to you, do you think anti, um, do you think Barack Obama is an anti-Semite, would you answer one way or the other? Yes, I would now. I've uh, said it privately uh, for a long time, but now I will publicly say he's an Israel-hating anti-Semite who is sympathetic to radical Muslim terrorists, He's released 700 terrorists from Guantanamo, 700. We now know at least one-third have become terrorists again. Why would you leave these radical Islamic terrorists from Guantanamo when you know the odds are high they're going to commit terrorism again? Why would you not go to the rally in France against radical Islamic terrorism when 50 nation national leaders uh, went there? Why would you not even use the term? <laughs> uh, I can really go on and on. So okay. no, this man, 
I'm sorry to say, uh, uh, isn't, is someone who is, I, I legitimately can say, as painful as it is for me to call my president an anti-Semite, but his hostility toward Israel has been enormous. You know, he's tried to cut aid to the, to the Iron Dome every time it's come up for monies. Congress reinstated the monies. Uh, okay. okay. I want well, I said, there, as Mark Levin would say, there I've said it. Okay, <laughs> you've said it. I want to push back now, and I want to hear what you have to say. Incidentally, this is why you are now considered to be a controversial figure on the American Jewish scene. There are many Jewish leaders who were very upset that Obama permitted this resolution to pass, and there are many who also believe that he, he and the United States was behind it. They are not calling him an anti-Semite. And way, let me finish. Let me, fi let me finish. He has more, Jews let around me, him he likes. Let me the Jewish people in general that he has enormous uh, antipathy towards. All right, let me finish. I'm sorry. Okay. So people argue that the way you are extreme is that you go to, uh, you take the extreme position. And the people who would confront you would say the following. There has been, by everyone's acknowledgement, there has been military and intelligence cooperation under the Obama administration that has been superb for the state of Israel. And although Israel wanted even more, the Obama administration just signed off on the largest foreign aid bill ever given to any country. And that therefore the argument is, Obama has intellectual disagreements with the way in which the Israeli government is formulating West Bank policy and policy as it relates to the two-state solution, but that it is not because he doesn't like Jews or he doesn't like Israel. What okay. do you answer? First of all, he well knows that this issue that the Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria will, will prevent a Palestinian state is a canard. It's a lie. The Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria comprise 2% of all Judea and Samaria. That's it, 2%. Israel has given 40% of it away to the Palestinian Authority. They run their own lives with everything except security. Uh, and, there, and there's 58% that's largely uninhabited. So Israel has been building since 93 homes there only within the boundaries of the existing communities in 1993. Not a single new community settlement has been built since 93. Yes, there are illegal outposts that have been built with a few hundred people here and there, but those are unimportant. So to make this an issue that this is stopping a potential Palestinian state when without saying that uh, the Palestinian Arabs have rejected a Palestinian state in 2000, 2001, and 2008, three times, virtually all of Judea and Samaria and big chunks of Jerusalem, without a counteroffer, shows that the issue is not statehood. The Palestinian Arabs want to destroy Israel, want to kill Jews. They have no interest in peace, because they could have had a state three times in the last 15 years. They said no. Now, in response to your question, which is a, legit a legit legitimate question, first of all, you say, uh, the security cooperation. I've talked to many people uh, in Israel about this. They say there was pretty good security cooperation, but they believe that one of the reasons for it is Obama wanted to know everything that Israel is doing or planning security-wise in order to respond if he doesn't like it. For example, when because of this close security cooperation, he found out Israel was planning to attack Iran in 2012. He called various countries where Israel was going to fly in and refuel, threatened them, and he also sent envoys almost every week to Israel, demanding they not hit Iran. So he wanted close security cooperation so he'd know everything Israel was doing. The $38 billion that you mentioned, first of all, this is about, that's for over 10 years, the $3.8 billion is about what Israel has been getting each year from the U.S. now. It's not an increase. It's about the same. And it's a very bad deal. Obama forced Israel to sign in the contract, we will not ask for any additional monies, even in an emergency. When Israel always asks for money in an emergency, now they're precluded from doing that. And Israel's not allowed to spend the money for their own home uh, armed uh, weapons uh, industries, which will hurt the weapons industries in Israel very badly. It also uh, hurts the, the uh, APAC and other uh, people who lobby for aid, because now the aid is done for 10 years and there's nothing more to ask about. And he did this as well to make it harder for people to say he's anti-Semitic. He's very conscious of this. He did this deal saying, how can you call me an anti-Semite? Just as you said, uh, Mark, I've given Israel a deal for $38 billion, even though it's not that great a deal at all, and I've had security cooperation. No, he cleverly has uh, 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 didn't done some things to make it look like he's supportive of Israel.
So when he does the harsh things, it'll be harder to say it's because of enmity toward Jews. Okay. That is my answer to that. Okay. Is this, in your mind, in any way partisan politics? Are Part you what? I'm sorry? Is this in any way, on your part, partisan politics that you tend to lean Republican and you don't like the Democratic president? A hundred percent not. I've had at least ten Democrats who've spoken at my dinners over the last uh, years, at least ten. At our missions to Washington, uh, we have 30 or 40 members of Congress and the and House and Senate speak. Uh, approximately half are Republican, half are, are Democrat. I myself voted for Michael Dukakis and Bill Clinton. Uh, I'm very close friends with uh, Chuck Schumer. He called me a week before our dinner last month, asked if he could come and speak. I said, absolutely. So, no, this, uh, this is, uh, I'm very close to many Democrats. Elliot Engel and Brad Sherman are great Democrats. This is only about Israel. I have criticized George Bush when he was president many, many times. I criticized Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice, Republicans who were bad toward Israel. My whole life, my whole commitment is to Eretz Israel, a, a strong and viable Jewish state. It has nothing to do with Republican or Democrat. If the Democrats uh, were wonderful, uh, whichever ones are, I praise them and happily so. No, this is not at all partisan politics. Okay, and I want the audience to know, I've been around Mort Klein for a long time. What he just said is 100% accurate. This is not a partisan stand, mm -hmm. either by him or by ZOA at all. Um, <laughs> you know, the head of the National Jewish Democratic Coalition, uh, Ira, I forget his second name, <laughs> years ago, I used to criticize Clinton all the time on Israel. Then I started criticizing Bush. He called me, uh, Ira, and he said, My God, Mort, I always thought you were partisan against uh, uh, Democrats. Now I see you're criticizing George Bush. I guess it really is all about Israel for you. Yes, so he it is. recognized it is. that my whole life is committed to Israel. Uh, I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican. Absolutely. His last name was Foreman, Ira Foreman. For Ira Foreman, that's correct. Thank so, you. so stay on this issue one more moment, however. Many people just blasted you because the ZOA invited Steve Bannon to your annual dinner. It turned out for reasons, I don't think any conscious reasons on your part, it, it, it just didn't work out. He didn't show up. But had he been able to come, you would have had Steve Bannon at your uh, annual dinner this year. There are many people who, who just in the Jewish community, you know, 70 percent, Oh, well, about 71 percent voted for Hillary Clinton. Some 29, 30 percent voted for Donald Trump. At the same time, there is a lot of anti-Trump feeling in the Jewish community. And you were blasted for asking Steve Bannon to come to your dinner when he's associated with Breitbart and other individuals who are charged with being racist, anti-Semites, anti -Semites, and all kinds of other extreme phobias. I want to give you a chance to explain why did you, you invite Bannon? When any, I always have important political people who call me before my dinners and ask if they can come. I did not invite Steve Bannon. He called me personally and asked if he can come to the dinner. He is the top uh, uh, policy strategist for the, for the incoming president of the United States of America. If he wants to come to my dinner, I said yes. I did not invite him. I wasn't going to honor him. Uh, not that I wouldn't necessarily, but he asked to come. I said yes. Chuck Schumer called the day after he called, said, can I come and can I speak? Chuck Schumer is a strong liberal Democrat who hates Obama. And I told Chuck Schumer, yes, you're welcome to come and you can speak. Anthony Weiner used to come to my dinners every year. He was a liberal Democrat before he had problems in his life. Uh, and he came every year and he spoke. I invited to give the Adelson Award, uh, the, one of our top awards, uh, to Bob Menendez a liberal Democratic senator from, uh, uh, from uh, New Jersey. So uh, when anyone important in politics asks to come to the ZO8 dinner, I believe it's my duty to say yes. <laughs> and Steve Bannon's articles in Breitbart on Israel and on campus anti-Semitism were extraordinarily pro-Israel. This man is one of the great friends of Israel. His articles were strong on Israel. When we were fighting City College for their anti-Semitic uh, uh, rallies they had, he had his journalists call... Uh, uh, Mayor de Blasio and, and the head of the City College and, and, and Governor Cuomo demanding, what are you going to do about this? So uh, he is the opposite of what uh, ADL, who retracted it, by the way, uh, have said and others have said. He is a philo-Semite, a lover of Israel and a lover of the Jewish people. So uh, I'm sorry he didn't come. 
but uh, he's a friend of ours. If he was truly an anti-Semite, an anti-Semite I would never let come to Israel. Nobody fights anti-Semitism more than ZOA and Mort Klein. Okay. Uh, I would never, ever allow an anti-Semite to come. If Keith Ellison wanted to come to our dinner, I would say no. <laughs> I got it. Okay. So, so Donald Trump is saying he's going to move the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, and there are people who say, well, that's not a smart move. It'll be counterproductive. How do you feel about Trump and his relationship to Israel, his appointment of David Friedman as the, or his nomination of David Friedman to be the U.S. ambassador, his willingness, or his, his interest in moving the, the embassy, and in general, how do you expect a Donald Trump presidency to impact the U.S.-Israeli relationship? In all the years since Israel has been reestablished re in 48, I've never seen or read about a stronger group of pro-Israel people around the president than the people around uh, President-elect Trump. Uh, Rudy Giuliani, <laughs> Newt Gingrich, uh, uh, Kushner, his son-in-law, David Friedman. Uh, I just go on and on. Tremendous supporters of Israel. Uh, so I think that he will clearly be a great friend to Israel. And I can tell you right now, I believe he will move that embassy to the holy Jewish city of Jerusalem within the first month of his administration. The first month. I'm saying this now on your, TV, on your show. And I'm saying on your show that uh, 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 he should do this. Jerusalem, you know, this is a propaganda lie that Jerusalem is holy to Muslims. It's not. It's never been the capital of any country except Israel. When they controlled it from 48 to 67, they allowed it to be a slum. They destroyed 58 synagogues in eastern Jerusalem. The Jewish holy books mentions uh, Jerusalem 700 times. The Koran never mentions it, not a single time. This is one of the great propaganda lies of our era, that Jerusalem's holy to Muslims. It's not. And that's why it should be moved there. And I told Trump's people, they asked me whether he should, sooner or rather later, and I said, it will send a message to the Muslims, to the Arabs, that this is a man of principle, a strong man who will not tolerate their nonsense anymore, uh, that the issue is uh, communities in Judea and Samaria, that uh, Jerusalem's holy to them. He won't tolerate this nonsense anymore. Okay. You know the so, yeah, so I support it, and I'm predicting he's going to do it within the first month. Okay. I'm going to hold you that prediction. We'll, let you, we'll, we'll see. If you're, if you're right, you're going to have to come on and get credit for it. Okay. Uh, now, look, the people who argue with you, and they consider themselves to be passionate supporters of the state of Israel, argue that for Israel to stay a Jewish and democratic state, the two-state solution is absolutely necessary. Today, as we're talking, you're running a piece by Carolyn Glick, and it's a beautifully written piece. She is extraordinarily articulate, thoughtful, and she's on the far right. And she wrote a book which was basically saying the two-state solution is a sham. She's saying to us everything we see in the Jewish community about the peace process and in America is a sham. I want to know your position on this problem. How do we keep Israel Jewish and democratic? Is that formulation, in your mind, Mort, an appropriate formulation for the problems I, confronting the Israelis vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians? I, uh, first of all, I, uh, the term two-state solution is a misnomer. Israel is already a state. It's a Palestinian state solution. That would be the correct term. Caroline Glick tells the truth as she sees it. Truth is not a political position. She's not a right-winger. She's told the truth about Arafat and Abbas, as have I. She's told the truth about their, their, their lack of interest in peace and they're wanting to destroy Israel and kill Jews. That's not a right-wing position. Now, you say about this Jewish and democratic, Israel's given away all of, all of Gaza, 40% of Judea and Samaria, 40%. That's where 99% of the Arabs live. So there's no issue about Israel remaining a Jewish state because they've already given away the areas where virtually all the Palestinian Arabs live. So this is a, another nonsensical statement that people talk about, like Kerry just talked about, uh, when uh, that's no longer possible. Uh, the 60% left of Judea and Samaria that have not, has not been given away, the communities are in 2% of it, the other 58% is largely uninhabited, maybe a few tens of thousands of people, that's it, not, not that many people in the scheme of things. So no, there's no uh, problem about Israel being Jewish and democratic, uh, uh, and, and even if they kept all, all of that territory, two-thirds of the people between the Mediterranean Sea and the, and the Jordan border uh, are Jews, two-thirds, even if you include all of the Arabs who live in Gaza and, Ju and Judea and Samaria. So even if they would re 
retake those areas, two-thirds will be Jewish. But they're not about to retake them, in my opinion. Okay, one last question in the one minute we have remaining. There are those who say that J Street is very far left. There are even some people who do not believe, and they've not been included in the President's conference, and that their positions sort of rule them outside mainstream Judaism, Jewry. And the same people say, and the ZOA is that extreme on the far right. And it's in that sense that the ZOA and you personally have been often called controversial. Do you want, what comment would you make in terms of ZOA and how do you feel when it's contrasted with J Street on the left? Well, look, J Street is not far left. J Street is anti-Israel. They're funded by George Soros since the beginning. They're funded by other anti-Israel Muslims. Why would they fund a pro-Israel uh, group if they're against Israel's very existence? Because J Street is anti-Israel. J Street has reveled in this U.N. resolution. J Street has urged Obama to, to not veto any anti-Israel resolutions. J Street endorsed the Goldstone Report. I go on and on. Uh, so J Street is just uh, set. They were, they're actually established by Obama and George Soros, got together, say, let's establish a Jewish group who will do whatever Obama believes in, and we can call them pro-Israel. So they're really a fraud uh, perpetrated in the Jewish people. They're anti-Israel. And when you say we are extreme on the right, what positions are we taking? that allow you, Mark, to make that statement. We oppose a Palestinian state. It's right now a PA Hamas state. It'll be a terrorist state. Uh, in the polls by American Jewish Committee, it's split 50-50. Half the Jews oppose a Palestinian state. We support the right of Jews to live in, the, in, in Judea and Samaria. Uh, the clear majority support that. We believe that the goal of the Palestinian Authority is to destroy Israel. AJ Committee poll, 75% believe their goal is to destroy Israel. We believe that Jerusalem should, not, should remain undivided. The vast majority of Jews agree. Mark, there's no positions we've taken in which half or more of the Jews don't agree with. So it is wrong and inappropriate for you to say we are far right-wing, not even right-wing. We're okay. really rational centrists who agree with half or more of the Jewish people in virtually really every position that we've taken. Okay, I want you to know, I didn't say it, Mort. I quoted those who do say it. I think you are wonderful. And I know there are some people who just... They don't want you around. I want you around always. I think you are a very important voice. And I've told you personally, you speak the truth always. I have enormous regard for you. Mm -hmm. And I thank you for all the kindness you've shown me over the years. Someone you, you, you respect, Izzy Liebler, wrote an article this week saying, ZOA has been the only Jewish organization to consistently criticize Obama's awful positions. And now ZOA has been vindicated. More wrote client, that last week. i got to leave. The clock has grabbed me. But thank okay. you for... We'll talk again soon, very soon. Thank, Thank you, you. It's Mort. great to be with you. Thank you. Mort Klein, president of the ZOA, the Zionist Organization of America. You know the people I thank. I always thank them. They're always wonderful. They're terrific. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends. <laughs>